Muchas gracias, probando. Me estaría faltando el presenter. ¿Está por acá? Uh, I need the clicker. Ok. <laughs> let's test. Great. So let's start with this presentation and throughout the day we've had different presentations discussing different concepts about the zeitgeist movement. We've discussed different alternatives to transition. We've had Peter talking about general concepts about his understanding of the world and the systems that rule market mechanisms and how it's not sustainable in time. But we haven't spoken much about the proposal of the zeitgeist movement that is the resource-based economy. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about understanding the concept of a resource-based economic model, what this is about. After 10 years of activism, we've um, created different materials with different levels of detail. So unfortunately, in the short time available, some things will be very high level, but uh, they are explained in the material that we've been uh, creating along the years. So what is a resource-based economic model first? Specifically, it's a system for the production and distribution of goods and services as any other, but it doesn't require the exchange of currency, barter, or any other kind of monetary exchange. This is the new thing about it. Yeah, no money, no barter, no exchange of money, exactly that. <laughs> In one of the old presentations I started giving in 2010, what we did was to present and compare a one-on-one -on -one comparison between the current monetary system and a resource-based economic model. And we did it comparing with comparing that with a car. So the car had certain requirements, particularly the gasoline, the gas, certain mechanisms, the engine I've just discovered I can point at the screen with the pointer, and the car produces certain positive things like movement and, of course, negative things like gas, heat, emissions, etc., like a simplified model. Now, so if we now move on to uh, more specific details, what are the requirements? of the car and of the monetary system for the car, well, the gas, which is the fuel of the monetary system. So we said that the monetary system requires four things, monetary incentive, that is, if, if there's no money, nobody does anything. I mean, and there are many popular phrases about this. Without money, nobody would do anything, and that would be the end of the economic system, and we would starve in a couple of months, and we would eat the chairs. It requires competition, because competition leads to progress. Without competition, we would all have gray t-shirts and we would all look alike. So competition generates progress. It's a requirement of the monetary system. It requires scarcity, because if everything were abundant, it would make no sense to trade and money would make no sense. There would be no competition. Nobody charges you for the air so far. So if I can convince somebody that something is scarce, I can charge more for that particular good. So it is a requirement of the monetary system. And it requires belong, um, ownership. I mean, it has to belong to somebody to buy them or sell them. So through these requirements of the monetary system and the mechanisms of the monetary system, that would be the mechanism of labor, I mean, the exchange of labor for money, for goods or services, we all participate in that eventually through the employer-employee-consumer mechanism. We say that there are people that own companies, they hire employees, and both behave as consumers in the market. They all buy or sell things. However, the relationship between the players is employer-employee in a business system, and both are consumers. They both go to the supermarket and buy cookies and that kind of things. And the cyclic consumption mechanism, that it needs to be maintained. You know, when consumption goes down, you see what happens. You know in your countries, you have to keep consumption active, because if it falls, if people don't buy or sell, money is not moving, and we're not exchanging things. If the economy doesn't grow. So we need a consumption that is always in, on the move so that the economy works. So with these three mechanisms, the monetary system produces certain things that might be positive, between inverted commas, like 
security because through the law enforcement uh, and different security entities that are employees, of course, they earn a wage and they protect us in exchange for that. They prevent us from being robbed, so we are safe with this mechanism between inverted commas. I can acquire things also. It allows for acquisition. Somebody that used to belong to somebody is now mine. As I paid for it, now it's mine. Remember about security and accumulation. If I want, I buy 10 notebooks. I can do that. Nobody prevents me from doing that. As opposed to prior systems before the monetary system where somebody with a stick would take all my things. Well, we all agree that the monetary system produces these positive aspects. And there are several negative products that are or outputs that are very well identified. It produces waste through different mechanisms. This competition of obtaining the best or producing best cell phone produces intermediate versions that are um, quickly abandoned. So everybody, there's an incentive to buy the latest version. So that leads to obsolescence, both the planned and the perceived obsolescence. The one that, that you plan is the one way. I do a version that won't last long precisely to then sell you the best, the best version. And then we have the perceived obsolescence that some things just become obsolete for natural reasons. And the perceived obsolescence, some things still work, but you just throw them away because you want the latest version. And this is promoted through marketing and different advertising systems. And of course, it produces a differential advantage through competition and the labor mechanism. Many consider that this is good because competition is good and it generates progress, but it implies that we have to fight to obtain the best things. If somebody got a job, then somebody else did not. So this would be sort of the functional model on which we are going to work. This is an oversimplification. There are many things like interest rates and the financial system, but it's enough to explain the logics that is inherent to the monetary system. On the other hand, the intention of that old presentation was to make a one-on-one -on -one comparison between the monetary system and a resource-based economy. How do they compare? This would be the car of the resource-based economy. We understand that as requirements, a resource-based economy needs functional incentives versus the monetary incentive. The functional incentive is that if my dog breaks a leg, nobody has to pay or, or, or because I, I'm not forced to know how to cure him because this is the model that makes Wikipedia works versus the old Encarta 98. Nobody in its own mind would have thought that the difference of model between paying a lot of people to write articles like in Encarta, if I had told somebody 10 years ago that I was going to upload a page and lots of people would write just because well, they would say I was crazy, but now we see what happens. People do things without money all the time and finding those functional incentives that are the things that we truly care to solve is a requirement of this model. As opposed, I mean, it might work without money. It might work with functional incentives. It requires cooperation as opposed to competition. It is clear in history that cooperation was always over uh, competition. Whenever we solved a problem is because we cooperated and minds got together to solve a problem. Competition generates some progress in the solution of problems. The truth is that negative outputs of competition makes you think, what is better? <clears throat> to cooperate to solve a jigsaw puzzle or to fight to see who solves it faster. It requires abundance. If there were scarcity, all the same problems and mechanisms would appear as in a monetary system. If everybody wants something and there's not enough, then we start with an exchange system and fights, etc. And the question is, do we have the technological resource to produce a functional abundance of most things, for instance, food, energy, etc. But our system requires abundance of access. People should have access to what they need when they need it. And time of exclusive use as opposed to owning things. Somebody told me, but in your system, what I see a bike on the street and I take it home. No, what is used is an assignment of exclusive use. When somebody's using something, it's recorded that nobody else can use it. Let's see how the problem is solved, because remember, there should be abundance. What would be the sense if everybody have, if everybody has access to a bike, why would they take another one? 
So from these requirements through the new mechanisms in the system, there will be automation in manufacturing instead of the labor mechanism that is exchanging labor for money for goods and services in an environment that we've seen in other presentations industrial automation moves forward there's fewer jobs for fewer people and the historical progression shows that most of the population works in agriculture when agriculture was automated with the tractors and all that all that population moved to the industrial sector and most people work in the large industries in cities when control and systems appeared well now all that technology is automated so most people were displaced from the factories few people in general now 25% of the population works in factories and in industries 70% work in services that was the move from the productive industrial sector to services. Today, 70% of the people work in services. Now, services are being automated. We have, I don't know, Amazon automated many vendors. You can buy anything and nobody sold anything. ATMs displace the human tellers. There are many examples. So what's the new sector that now employs people as other jobs are automated none as far as i know so we're going to start seeing how technology displaces more and more workers therefore breaking that mechanism of labor so we say that we'd automate as much as we can no more labor remember that there's abundance cooperation financial incentive just make things available for people not because you are good but because it's possible and this would eliminate most of the crimes against property, that is over 90%. So we propose the mechanism of automating as much as we can. This wouldn't go against the worker uh, themselves. Joint productive participation. Now there's a correlation between employer and employee. If the employee asks for a rise, asks for a raise, the profitability of the employer goes down. In this case, the joint productive participation means that we all want that automated system to work in the best way. So the incentive system changes. And through a dynamically balanced consumption, instead of the cyclical consumption that should never stop and should always grow, we try to have a system for the production of goods and services according to the capability of the planet to generate them. So consumption should be related to the productive capability of the system. So th through these new mechanisms and these requirements, the resource-based economy will generate positive outputs like real security, because the only way that nobody steals anything from me is that nobody will need it because they have their own. And I don't need the law and law enforcement to protect me. There's just no reason for anybody to take my things away. 90% of the crimes are based on that. Access, because through automation, we might increase productivity. There would be no high competition. I could have access to things through this exclusive use. I could have availability that requires and uh, more explanation, but then we're going into the details when we move forward on the model and how it works. It's like bikes in the city of Buenos Aires. I should have availability. I mean, there should be enough bikes for nobody to uh, fail to find one, as there's no competition and I don't need to reduce costs. This might be obtained through these mechanisms. Then structural recycling could be incorporated. It's no longer a cost for the companies to recycle or treat the effluence of the plants. There's no damage to the productive system, as is the case today. True equality, because we don't have to compete against one another for the same jobs because they are automated, so we will be able to do whatever we want. And structural efficiency, because as I said, this cost structure that prevents companies from doing things in an ethical way, as all production is automated and as the employer, employee, consumer mechanism is obsolete, will produce a structural efficiency. So those are the two models, the comparison between a monetary system and the resource-based economy. Therefore, to clarify, what is the Zeitgeist movement? We propose a modification of requirements, mechanisms, and products in the current system. Specifically, we <coughs> proposed a modification in the requirements. The monetary incentive, that is the to turn it into a functional incentive, to change competition for cooperation, scarcity for abundance of access. I mean, the universe 
is not abandoned, it's scarce. But if they're managed in a smart way, we can make it accessible to anybody. And ownership to exclusive use time. And about mechanisms from labor to automation, from employer employee consumer to joint productive participation, cyclical consumption for dynamically balanced consumption and the outputs, acquisition for access, accumulation for availability, security for true security, ways for structural recycling, differential advantage, this competition for true equality, and planned obsolescence for structural efficiency. Very nice model, but so what? What do we do about it now? Now, I will I compare this with a car. Let's see how it starts, how it works, the ignition. Let's turn it on. I'm going to introduce you a friend, Wilfred. He's an ordinary guy in a um, resource-based economy. And Wilfred will want to do things as a person in capitalism in the monetary system that wants to buy, sell, have a T-shirt. Wilfred is an ordinary guy in a resource-based economy. The basic, how would this model work? has to do with Wilfred having access to things through demand. His demand through production distribution offers a good and service to him. The intention is that the excess, the surplus of that is recycled to go back to resources and energy that is necessary to produce things. So basically, this model doesn't differ at all from any other economic system. So there's nothing new so far. It's a system for the production and distribution of goods and services. The concept of supply and demand exist, but let's see the mechanisms that should be present. More concretely, we need to set some uh, operational mechanisms. Obviously, a mechanism of demand. How can I get what I need? Uh, I want a t-shirt, I want food, how can I get it? A mechanism of production. How you decide what to produce and how to produce it. Then a mechanism of distribution. How I get what I need. A mechanism of restriction. Anyone can order anything. And the, mecha the mechanism of participation. So there must be some mechanism of restriction and a mechanism of participation. How can I put forward a new form of production? How I can get engaged? How can I participate in that joint productive operation? So the first question that comes to our mind is, who decides what should be produced? Is there an evil robot that tells me what I have to do and controls it all? Well, it l sounds funny, but uh, imagine this kind of uh, robotic styling that um, um, kicks people and gives orders. No, Wilfred is the ordinary man who will make the decision on what is produced. How? Through demand. Through the um, resource-based economy, we have a lot of Wilfreds making decisions. So, And how does the robot learn what it has to produce? Is it an ubiquitous uh, robot? Is it a robot that knows it all? So there is an evil ubiquitous robot that tells uh, people what to do? No, there is a mechanism of demand. It is people who tell the productive system what is required. Imagine that somebody goes into an Amazon for the resource-based economy, and they run a search for a t-shirt. Today, you will have several bidders. You choose the one you want. You pay, make the payment, and the person collects the money and sends you the t-shirt. You don't need any omniscient robot, um, a robot that knows it all. Imagine that we are talking about conceptual ideas here, and you can propose different mechanisms. So the mechanism learned that I need something. So this is the automated production and distribution system. Now, what are the production mechanisms? You require technology, materials, etc. Once this has been distributed, you need to select the proper materials for pr the production of this particular good. What are the closest places to the buyer, and in this uh, demand-based system, you know more or less uh, what uh, the IP address is. So this is not new. I'm just talking about things that already exist today. So the production mechanism has to be able to produce that good. Now, 
we have a problem of calculation now. How much material do we need to produce that good? This is the old Hayek's problem. It is impossible to calculate all the variables in the economics. So the only way of doing this is through the free exchange uh, with a market-based system. So the calculation problem cannot be solved. So we use a calculation system. The there is a branch of mass that is focused on decision making. So I have 5,000 tons of uh, fabric. What should I produce? Uh, uh, curtains, drapery, or um, T-shirts? So since the system is aware of the demand, I know how many people are asking for drapery and how many are asking for T-shirts. I can determine the amount needed for each, and then I can uh, adjust uh, that production to the demand that I sense from the population. So this is used across the entire industry. But you may say, well, these are too many products. You have camera lenses. You have 10,000 different types of camera lenses. You have different types of batteries. There are already some coding systems today because that are being used for classifying goods. And the customs uh, um, authority at the global level has uh, these classifications. And there are some others that have even a better coding system. This has a barcode, for instance, uh, that is a GS1 global standard that has a uh, exclusive and unique identifier for this product. So it's not difficult to identify which are the products and which is the one that one person asks for, what are the components required to produce this good. There is no intrinsic problem in making that calculation. With the currently available technology, there is no calculation that cannot be uh, sort solved. But it's not an unsolvable problem. So the production mechanism is automatic. So what is the condition that it needs to meet? It has to be adapted to demand. If I make an order and I, it takes four months to get the t-shirt, then I will be in trouble. So how fast can the system respond to the demands of people in terms of time? So the metric here has to do with time. What would be the better response time for this system in order to deliver the goods to people? So you weigh here the requirements of people, the available materials, the potential uses, the frequency of use, and access to the technology available in order to meet people's requirements. Now, there are different types of production. Let's say that if systems are automated, production could take place in real time or in a preventive manner. In real time, the system reacts and produces the good from the very moment that it receives the need from the interested party. I click on a T-shirt, and the production process um, is triggered after that. Imagine all the T-shirts that are um, stamped, and then um, the, that is the starting point of the production uh, process for fulfilling the demand of T-shirts. You don't need to keep any stock. Uh, you don't need to forecast the demand. So that reduces uncertainty by producers. This is something that could easily be put in place. Response time is the variable that you need to minimize. If it takes four months to get a t-shirt, then it would not be convenient. And then you have preventive type of production mechanisms. If I want a piece of bread, I cannot plant uh, the seeds of wheat uh, two hours before. So there you need to measure consumption levels in order to be prepared. So here you use the mean use statistics. So and what do I need? Most of the people are not riding a bicycle right now. So if you sense that 20% of the population is riding a bicycle, now you may produce 22% of bicycles with a Gaussian bell diagram. You would use uh, these, the average plus two or three segments. So the probability of having too much outside is quite small. If I see that four or five people are left without bicycles, I can just make the necessary adjustments to that chart. 
This is not something that I came up with. This is what banks do with the minimum cash requirements. This is what internet uh, providers do. They just hire the mean uh, use statistics uh, in order to reduce costs. And this also re uh, reduces the use of resources. Unlike the monetary system where each person should buy their own car when, although most of the time they keep it parked outside. So this is part of the shared economy. So the distribution mechanisms, they can happen in uh, real time. That is to respond to real time demands. That is when I order the T-shirt, I just get a T-shirt uh, dropped by a drone at my door. Or you may have some driverless vehicles um, or trucks. This technology already exists. Victor, have you seen anything like that? And so um, it doesn't matter. The, the price issue is a separate issue. Oh, you can use distribution centers for this that are basically supermarkets. So if you have made a proper calculation, the supermarkets will not run out of stock. So you just take whatever you need. So you would go there, and in, from a preventive standpoint, you already calculated the mean uh, statistical use. And then I have a golden um, toilet here, but it could be a golden toothbrush. If he wants 100 of these, what is the restriction mechanism? Well. To be concrete, when we look at the calculation problem, we need to calculate the best materials to solve a specific problem. A toilet made of gold uh, will not depend on the material that is made. Um, of course, you need not to be broken when you said, but it is a cultural issue here. So. Here, it wouldn't make any sense. You could produce it with the most reasonable material in order to maximize distribution and accessibility. And more particularly, in this specific system, there are some false restrictions. In 2001, there were a lot of people without the purchasing capability, but the supermarkets still had the products there. They had fans, blenders, food, and people couldn't access to those goods. So there was a false restriction there that was this. this uh, connected from reality. So the system produces a false restriction. There is a restriction. If you don't have money, you cannot do anything. In a uh, resource-based economy, if you don't have food, if you don't have that, then that leads you to scarcity. So the restriction mechanisms are the carrying capacity of the earth at that time and the uh, production capacity. And then, how can I participate? I, how can I produce this T-shirt quicker? Will the robot let me do that if I came up with an idea? Yes, actually, you can participate. This evil robot is not going to prevent you from participating. You can use open source software. The whole community can um, use open source, and they will have access to that uh, source code. If we didn't have the problem of patents, if we didn't have the problem of business competition that protect their intellectual property, and everybody had access to the drawing plans, the engineering drawings, um, everybody would be able to participate. And there would be no restriction for this to be available to the public. Therefore, participation is much more secure than in an exchange-based economic system. So these contributions can be freely made and you can overcome some efficiency requirements here. With, uh, in the open source community, they do not implement any change that people come up with. There will be somebody testing that, and if they meet certain requirements, they might implement it. Now, having said all this, let me show you some keys for transitioning to this system. The first step is to come up with an abundance and sustainable energy matrix. Uh, it is important to think about sustainability of the species, to declare all resources as the common heritage of the entire humankind. So this requires some awareness raising for this to be implementable. And then to build a culture of consumption based on the utility and not on the distortions of the cultures. I may want to have 700 cars, but that is a completely validated cultural distortion. So actually, I need transportation, efficient, effective transportation. I want to go from point A to point B as fast as possible. So this requires a 
a significant cultural change. Can you picture a world like this? I know that it is very difficult because it is hard for us to think about that. Whenever we think about economy without money, you may say, no, this is not possible. This is what Peter was saying. But if you start drilling down in the mechanisms, you will not see any obstacles. The technology is available. It is just a matter of interconnecting it. There is no obstacle. You can do this with currently available technology. Wilfred and, uh, you, of course, you can picture Wilfred and this evil robot. So we will have to keep on working on that. So thank you.